Unleavened Bread Ministries presents From your hands, your feet, your side Unleavened Bread Jesus Bible Studies with David Eels Can quench my thirsting soul Pure as water made me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Greetings, saints. Many blessings to you. Thank you for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. We appreciate you so much. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you give us wisdom today. Uh, Help us to do warfare against the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. O Lord, teach everyone in their home that they can be responsible to take care of these problems in their own homes and we thank you father for doing that in jesus name amen well i'm going to do part three of they shall cast out demons um just want to remind you something a little bit here um lay a foundation um being in the bride is a great reward and they're going to be given a great reward too so I, I pray that none of you miss it. <clears throat> we know that many, because of sin and um, oppression of demons, um, will be cast into outer darkness and will receive no reward whatsoever. But we know that Second um, Corinthians seven one says. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, you can notice here that by the power of God, you can cast out the spirits in your house, which you are responsible for. And many are seeing this in these days. Um... Thank you, Father, for giving us that grace to understand this in Jesus' name. And um, I'll remind you, too, that something I shared recently on a program, and that is that Eve had a dream that Father was sweeping out the last remnants of uh, dirt from the bride's new beautiful white house. And in parallel to that, the bride, being typed by Eve in that dream, was throwing the cats out of the house because they messed on the floor. Uh, that sounds like a defiling to me. And uh, also, they would not kill the last few mice, representing their beastly flesh. And uh, then she said that, quote, I was complaining to the man whom she said was her father, sweeping the floor as I went to throw the trash bag into the can on the porch, and I was walking towards the front door. The man was angry and disappointed at the cats and said to me, I guess I'll have to take away their reward. He said this with sadness as he finally grabbed the dustpan and swept the last little pile of dirt into it to toss it outside. And then she gives the verse, John 15 and 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. And, of course, the cats represent self will people who have refused to get rid of their sins, even though they know the gospel, that they have authority over sin. They do not take it nor exercise faith to do warfare against it or the demons that enforce it. So, saints, um, God's getting serious about this. He says we're running out of time you know, to be in the bride and to bear the fruit and so on and so forth, and to receive the great reward that the bride is going to receive, which is over and above 
anything else the rest of the church is going to receive, as you can see by the parables of Scripture. Um, and then after the last sin and sinner left the house, symbolized by the cats and the dirt, the reward was given. They moved into the larger house, which we have already spoken about as more freedom, more power, more people, uh, many things. The, the uh, liberty that Jesus had, he, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed, right? So we can see that <clears throat> this sin and the sinners have been holding up the reward. And I encourage you to sanctify yourselves and repent of any sinful thoughts or ways. Confess your sins and pray one for another that you may be a part of the clean bride so you will receive the reward of the larger white and holy house. And again, the parables point this out, like Esther, who was chosen from among the virgins of the kingdom and moved into the king's house after becoming pleasing unto him. And it's going to be that way today. The church, of course, is totally deluded and destroyed every parable by saying that the whole church is the bride. No such thing. Remember the Shulamite and Song of Solomon? Or Shulamite means the perfected one. She found her king, didn't she? I mean, if you're seeking after the Lord, you're going to find him. This is all very clear. It's either the sin goes or the person goes, at least as far as being in the bride at this time. And um, <clears throat> we are concentrating on getting cleaned up for the Lord and His rewards to the bride. He has led us to have deliverance sessions for those who have asked in our local body. And the brethren are taking advantage of this. Uh, you can do this in your own family or in your own group. Remember, 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we know that... Um, We're told uh, in Romans chapter 6, Reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. And let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Yes, there is a way to let not sin reign. Sin is uh, something that invites the devil and the demons into your life and uh, gives, gives it much more power. And, of course, you know, if there's something that you feel you haven't been able to overcome, you might, might should look at whether this is not just flesh but a demon spirit enforcing that flesh. So, uh, obviously, um, if you want to be in the bride, you're, you have to be growing during the season that you have to grow and mature. And um, don't waste the time. And uh, redeem the time. The days are evil. Um, I believe, you know, everyone is making a, a list of their temptations. We've already gone through our local assembly and some others who contacted us. But everyone's making a list of their temptations, which are also the names of demons. <laughs> like rejection, fear, anger, faction, lust, so on, on and on. <clears throat> and this list is a, is a way to confess your sins, which God then promises to deliver you from in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light, that's not in darkness, right? Because we've been delivered out of the power of darkness. But if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Some don't have fellowship with others, can't have fellowship with others because of their sin. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. It's an awesome promise. We're having, therefore, these promises. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, um, we have been using this list uh, from each person to quickly get to the deliverance of demons of known temptations because you know the demons, how they manifest through your known temptations. And then we forcefully command the demons which are left to give their names. And, of course, in the name of Jesus, we cast these unknown ones out too. And it's been doing a wonderful job. Many are really excited about changes of things that were most many, many things were inherited you know that people have had all their lives uh, of course uh, we're not finding the the big things the the, the strong demons uh, because many of these have already been dealt with through the word that a lot of people study with us it's powerful to deliver people from sin and from demons so we're not finding the, the great big problems, you know. Uh, but the man, these are coming out with manifestations. Um, and when, a, when, a, a, when you command them to speak, of course, the most common way that they speak is in your mind or in the mind of the person that's being delivered, right? And they can take over their mouth. We have seen that, too, of the person being delivered. So tell the person to cooperate and to give the name if they hear it in their mind. Um, we know that these are these can be strange names from different languages of peoples or false gods, and um, that of course they have inhabited through the centuries, right? Strange names, foreign names. Also, they can be descriptive names, like we just mentioned. They'll answer to either name. They'll obey either name. You just have to believe that. And they will obey you if you believe it. Mark 16 and 17 says, And these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. And Luke 9 and 1 and he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all, all demons and to cure diseases. Luke 10 and 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall in any wise hurt you. You need to believe that too, that they don't have authority over you. I've been threatened by all kinds of people, uh, witches and, um, you know, false religious cults who did black masses to destroy me. And um, the wicked can't do that. You know, if you're walking in him, you're trusting in him and you cast down their authority, they just can't do it. And Psalm 91 is clear that, that his angels will bear thee up lest you dash your foot against a stone, right? Also, uh, ask God for words of knowledge or wisdom and discerning of spirits um, or a vision if necessary, anything to help you deliver the person either in your family or yourself uh, or in your assembly or whatever. And you should also command the demons to tell the truth because it doesn't come natural to them. <laughs> <laughs> you 
and uh, forbid them to hide because they like to do that, move around and hide. So you tell them do not move from the place from place to place in the body of the person, but to come out in Jesus' name, right? Whatever you tell them, they have to do. You just have to know that, right? Sometimes they will manifest in ways to try to stay by holding on to some part of the person's insides, <laughs> which can can be felt as uh, pressure or pain or burning or tingling or different manifestations. And... um Father's been doing a tremendous job in our local body and in larger UBM because people are doing this in their homes. And there's much uh, rejoicing and the testimonies of demons being removed that were received in childhood or inherited. They sometimes come out with various manifestations like coughing and yawning gagging, physical feelings, or sometimes nothing at all. You just feel light delivered, right? So, and also I suggest that you don't stand around and keep commanding them to come out because then they know you don't understand authority and they will just play games with you and they'll move around and they'll do different things, you know, and try to get you to act on what you see rather than what you know. Jesus didn't do this. He didn't spend hours casting out demons. He just commanded them and walked on, you know. Uh, So forcefully give the command and and move on to the next one. Some some will uh, come out immediately and others may come out for several days afterwards. But you have to hold on. Uh, to your faith hold fast the confession of your hope that it waver not for he is faithful it promised and they will come out they have to come out because you told them to and you have to believe that right and when the person feels free of the uh, in the meeting just pray for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit some people are getting more filled with the Holy Spirit than they ever have been simply because the demons aren't hindering And exhort them to stay in the Word, which um, keeps our mind in correct order so that demons can take advantage of us, right? And we've received words from the Lord recently that God is giving a, uh, a lot of grace right now for this cleansing process, to finish up this cleansing process, like uh, in Eve's dream, to sweep out the last little bit of dirt, right? Praise God. I'll share this uh, testimony here with you. It's uh, We called it Deliverance in Tasmania uh, from Rian and Claire. They said, Dear David, we have experienced many acts of deliverance while being in Tasmania. However, recently Claire has been struggling with anger again over the past few weeks. And last Sunday, she decided to fast for the week, and almost immediately she had a headache that took over her whole head. Yeah, demons can do that. They don't like you to fast. Besides the natural and normal headache people get sometimes, like if they drink coffee and they're they're now off of it, uh, about the third day, that stuff starts leaving your system and you get a headache. That's... That happens quite regularly, but demons also do this. They can even, they, if they know you're going to a deliverance session, they can give you a headache. We've had that happen. How people felt bad or because the, the demons knew they were going to a deliverance session and tried to stop them from going. Many people said that. They tried to stop me from doing this. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. And uh, anyway, uh, Rian went on. He said, By Friday afternoon, we were at a point of desperation. Even though we have commanded demons to leave many times uh, for others as well as ourselves. And this time it seemed we did not pray uh, with authority. 
Well, that could be, but I'll tell you this. I know this, that casting out individual demons is good, always, but getting out all of their support or supporting demons uh, in this manner that we're talking about is better and longer lasting. I mean, demons open doors to other demons that are associated with them and are needed in their their work. And so if you if you know one demon, you know of other associated demons that come along with that, you know, and you can deal with them. So when you when you do this thorough job, basically you're closing a lot of doors that the demons can use to open up and to bring back what you just cast out. But when you do this thorough job and they don't have any support anymore, it's much harder for them to come back, right? And uh, he went on to say uh, the demon showed itself to Claire as a green snake and only partly appeared uh, and wanted to come out but didn't. And every time it came out into the light, it got burnt and thus receded. And so, okay, this is a, a demon that manifests and then goes back to hiding, right? Well, they're, all of them will basically do that. You know, they want to hide. They want you to believe this is just you. They don't want you to believe that this is a demon that you can focus on and cast out. Which, by the way... You can struggle with sins uh, for a long, long time. And if you don't take care of the demons many times, uh, you won't make as much progress, obviously. But you know you were delivered out of the power of darkness. In other words, the demons and the sin has no power over you. It was canceled at the cross. So... We realized that we both suffered from anger even though we expressed it differently. Ironically, this made me angry towards Claire as well as God, but uh, as you will find out, it only lasted about a day. Yeah, because they got rid of them, right? So on Saturday afternoon, we listened to the teaching of Thursday, May the 30th, regarding deliverance. And how awesome is God that he planned that we listen to that specific teaching on this day. Yes, he, he's sovereign over all things, and he can certainly have you in the right place at the right time and not in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you're always marvel when you stumble into the will of God and you say, hmm, this must have been God, right? Yeah. So tonight we had a little deliverance session and prayed for each other. We are the only two members of our fellowship when our kids are asleep. <laughs> so before we started, we confessed our sins to each other and also listed and forgave everyone that we needed to. Number one thing there, always confess your sins and always forgive these are the two main things that keep people from getting deliverance. Many times the demons will say, we have a right to be here. A lot of times they lie, and they don't have a right, and you can tell them that and cast them out. But if there is some, some uh, uh, willful disobedience that is not being repented of, uh, or unforgiveness, which turns a person over to Satan, um, um, or unforgiveness that Jesus said Matthew eighteen thirty four and 35 would cause you to be turned over to the tormentors by the Father Himself. Now you can't you can't uh, permanently get demons out when you've been turned over to demons. So if you find that they keep coming back, you need to examine if you've forgiven everyone, right? And confess your sins, because he said he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So those are two very important things before deliverance you should do. 
then we could speak with authority to a list of demons and they have all packed their bags and left our house. (laughs) Praise God. Uh, Claire's headache, as well as mine, has disappeared and the nose dried up immediately. Praise the Lord. Um, And we received Amos 3, 5 through 7. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is set for him? You know, let me say, the demons are constantly setting snares for people. That when you cross that line uh, and fall into temptation and sin, they have permission from God to chasten such a person. And uh, like Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, turned a man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Uh, The curse that is causeless alighteth not. So, you know, there's a reason. Try to find the reason. Try to find the cause. If you just deal with the effect instead of the cause, you might be doing it again, doing it again, doing it again. I want to say, sometimes people on the surface, um, you know, have blocked things from their minds. And they don't want to recognize, for instance, that they may not be forgiving someone. We've had that happen. And uh, deliverance was impossible until the person, you know, uh, I, I would say came more and more under the curse and decided it was not worth blocking this thing from their mind or believing that they've forgiven somebody that they haven't. You know, if somebody, when they come to your mind, you have bad feelings, guess what? You you haven't forgiven them. So you can waste a lot of time on somebody trying to get them delivered if they are not forgiving people and have been turned over to the tormentors by the Father himself. So... Shall a snare spring up from the ground and have taken nothing at all? Well, quite often the demons are successful to take people down because people are not uh, dealing with their sins every day, being consistent. And, uh, and being, uh, by the way, being consistent to cast out demons because demons open doors for demons, right? Yes, they do. And there's 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 uh, the main demon, which many times is called uh, the doorkeeper demon, because he opens the door for the lesser demons to come in. And when you start c- commanding demons to come out, by the way, sometimes the doorkeeper demon pushes these little demons forward and sacrifices them. Um, and but but by the way. If you just keep taking those out as he pushes them forward, you're going to finally get to him, and he won't have any support. So you can cooperate with them as they cooperate with you. Take the demons out, whichever ones come forward and speak, you know. Shall the trumpet be blown in the city and a people not be afraid? Yeah, you know, many people's city is being invaded by an enemy that seeks to kill them, and they act like nothing is happening. Shall evil befall a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Yes, even if evil comes, the Lord invited uh, beast entities to take over his people uh, when they fell into sin. And that's a chastening that turns people back to God. So the Lord uses the demons to do that. The Lord has done it. If evil comes, the Lord has done it. Whether it's the, the beast entity against a city or a nation or uh, a beast entity against your own self, your mind. Surely the Lord will do nothing except he reveal his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Yes, and you know, we just you just shared a method, a method. Uh, God's got methods that are very good. You can ask Him for all of those, uh, discerning of spirits, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, visions, 
to identify demons and to cast them out. He has these, and another one is to demand that they give their name. So wisdom will will direct you in this regard. If you truly repent and truly don't want these demons ruling over you and ruining your life and ruining your your uh, family's life, go for it. Do warfare. Don't get distracted. The other things are not important, right? And, of course, uh, he went on to say we prayed for our kids to receive deliverance too. And here's a list of demons that no longer reside in these willing vessels. Okay, let me say before I read these lists that they are types of much larger lists that could be coming against you. And you can tell by the nature. It doesn't matter what the nature is. The nature can be a demon. You may think some of these things on this list are just flesh and not demons. But it really doesn't make any difference. You can command either one to come out, can't you? Because we were delivered. He said, reckon yourself to be dead unto sin. If it's an act of faith that helps you to win the battle... Command even the flesh to be gone from you in the name of Jesus. You know, we were delivered of flesh, too, at the cross and have authority over it. And also many things are inherited through the bloodlines, but we have received the blood of Jesus, which is pure, right? We got new blood. Everything, the curses that were passed on from your parents to you, uh, you're not under anymore. You're under the new blood of Jesus Christ. Reconciliation has been made, right? So you can uh, command inherited spirits and uh, flesh to go from a person. It will help them to exercise faith that they've been delivered. Remember what Jesus said, All things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them, and you shall have them. So... Oh, here's the list. Uh, Rion's list is uh, rejection, uh, anger, irritation, hate. You'll find you'll find uh, associated demons here that help one another. They're very close, you know. Um, racism, greed, rebellion, lust, lying, impatience, know-it-all. <laughs> Yet they. The answer to some names like that, laziness, tiredness, and got a healing for ears, um, healing for the hip. So, of course, these are problems in the flesh that can be spirits of infirmity. You can cast out spirits of infirmity. Selfishness, critical, judgmental, self-righteous, faction, so on. Um, and Claire had a list. You know, I'm, I'm helping you to see just a across a uh, pattern of different demons that you you may realize there is a descriptive name for any lust or any problem that you have, and they will answer to that, just as they will their personal name. Sometimes they give their personal name when you command it. And it may, like I said, may be very different kind of name because it comes from a different culture, maybe thousands of years ago, uh, you know. And sometimes they don't make any sense whatsoever. Tongues are tongues of men or or uh, tongues of angels, right? So they can be an, 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 an otherworldly name, right? So Claire got anger, jealousy, James Dean. <laughs> yes, demons can take on names like that. And she has a little note here. Who knew? You know, who knew that would happen? You know, uh, gluttony, vanity, lack of confidence, overanalyzing, researching, laziness, tiredness, controlling, uh, critical, judgmental. And sometimes that these things don't come up in a person's life, but I asked everybody to examine what are they tempted with. You know, they don't come up to the measure of a of a demon. They're just flesh. 
Doesn't matter. You don't want it. Cast it from you in the name of Jesus by faith, right? And Micah got uh, picking his skin, a child here, picking his skin, uh, bullying, selfishness, arguing, vanity, low self-esteem, and silliness. Well, some kids are just a little silly, huh? Um, so, you know, whatever is the problem, you know, deal with the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness behind it. You know, don't just beat up on the child, you know, because a lot of parents do that. They think they're because they're wrestling with flesh and blood instead of the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. We don't want to do that. You can act, actually hurt your children, not just physically, but mentally, if you keep trying to beat something out of them. Uh, do some spiritual warfare. And, you know, you say, I don't feel comfortable. Well, get some help. Get somebody around you that will cast out demons, right? Get some help. Somebody to agree with you. Get among people that are like the first disciples. And if they're not healing the sick and casting out demons, they're not disciples of Christ. These signs shall accompany them that believe. Jesus has a right to identify what a believer is. A believer is just what a disciple was in Jesus' day. Nothing less. Uh, Tabitha. Fairness. Some people feel I, um, like they should enforce fairness. <laughs> uh, victimhood. Vanity. Comparison. Disobedience. Sly, overreacting. Okay, we're getting through all the children here. Daniel, disobedience, disrespect, rebellion, anger, self-will, whining, and tantrums. Well, boy, I tell you, thank God for delivering this family from, from these enemies, right? Ain't God good? So... We both had dreams last night after the deliverance. Hmm, here's Claire's dream. There was a big purple snake in an enclosure. However, the enclosure did not have a ceiling or glass between us and it. Instead, it was gauze. <laughs> this snake was able to transform into a Middle Eastern looking girl who hid from us. Well, the girl, uh, Middle Eastern could, could mean foreigner, foreign to you, shouldn't be in you for sure. The little girl may well be uh, Claire's fleshly fruit. Don't know. Um, flesh as well as demons hide from us, but their symptoms give them away. The names above that we've mentioned are are their nature and she she went on to say after trying to catch the snake and it moving around continuously it started coming through the vent it became like a gas i believe this is representing spirits coming into the house through unrepented sin yes that's what they do do yourself a favor. Uh, continuously confess your sins one to another and pray one for another, okay, as the Scripture commands. I mean, you don't need this buildup, this geometric progression of demon infestation, do you? No, well, keep up with it, okay? At this point, I turned to Rian and said to him, this thing is playing games with us, and they will do that. They will deceive you. I commanded it out in Jesus' name, and it was gone. And demons do many things to deceive us regarding their presence. They don't want you to believe that you have a demon. They'll even get mad when somebody says to you, That's a demon. <laughs> they get mad. 
Uh, here's the word that they received, Luke 12:46. Uh, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he expecteth not, and in an hour when he knoweth not, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint his portion with the unfaithful. So, we have to be diligent to keep our house clean of all defilements of flesh and spirit, because God could come any day for us. People do die unexpectedly. They are taken from this world in different ways. We've got a great, we have great disasters coming. We've been told by the Lord that are going to kill many people here in America, especially. So keep up with it, right? And that servant who knew his Lord's will and made not ready, nor did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. So if you know, once you know and you have understanding that you are to resist and stand against sin and the demons, and you don't do it, you're going to get a whipping. And probably they have something to do with the whipping. Demons make you miserable. But he that knew not and did things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. And to whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom they commit much of him will they ask the more. So when you know of sin and how to deal with it by the promises of God or demons and how to deal with them by the promises of God, you're responsible to apply the sword of the Spirit and the blood of Jesus to it, right? Amen. Okay, here's Rion's dream. I was getting into a boxing ring for a bare fist match. Hmm, that hurts. <laughs> My opponent was a plain looking middle aged woman. She was quite chatty, despite my best punches, jabs, uppercuts, big swings all landing fairly well. It didn't move or phase her an inch. And I looked at the crowd in disbelief, and they all seemed to agree and wait, waited eagerly for something to happen. And uh, he said, we believe this woman is wisdom. Well, if so, um, many of our actions and uh, words are against her. This was a, a fight, right? As exhibited by boxing with her. But she will endure and be there for us if we will listen. She is one who we need to cooperate with to be able to do warfare. Wisdom, prophets. For warfare against our enemies, right? But a lot of things we say and do are against our own well-being. We speak the curses on ourselves because we disagree with the word. Um, we can uh, act in ways that will open doors for the devil to come against us. How can you win a battle when you're the one letting the enemy in, right? So this is what this dream is all about, this demonstration, I believe. And he said, she was not able to fall, but stayed upright against all the attacks. And afterward, um, Claire heard she should look at Proverbs 4, as I was telling her the dream. Proverbs 4, 6, and 7, they mention here, forsake her not, and she will preserve thee. Love her. And she will keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Yea, with all thy getting, get understanding. Well, you need wisdom and understanding if you're fighting an enemy. They call it in the physical world intelligence. <laughs> Although there isn't much there, it's, um, and a lot of it's turned evil in these days. Uh, intelligence is necessary to know what your enemy's doing. 
and to agree and to exercise the promises of God, which are our own intelligence, right? And uh, they said, many blessings, and we trust this will bring joy to the brethren. It certainly has to us and other people, you know, um, we've uh, talked to people around the world during this. And it's kept us pretty busy. That's why we're hoping that everybody will do it themselves. <laughs> um, and she goes on to say, Thank you for sharing the word, the truth. It builds up our faith. As always, God is a wonderful deliverer. Well, amen. Well, Father, we ask that you, you know, uh, Remove the roadblocks in the way of brethren that are listening today to doing this. I know that sometimes um, one parent may be a believer and one not, uh, at least as the Scripture hath said. You know, there are many, many religious people out there who don't, wouldn't think of casting out demons, even though it's to their own destruction. And they don't believe in it, or they may not even believe in the demons. And they may claim to be Christian, but they're Christian as Christ-like. He believed in demons, and he cast them out. It was probably at least a third of his ministry of casting out demons, and his disciples too. How can we say that we are disciples of Jesus if we don't do the same thing? He said, uh, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And so what he did, casting out demons, is something we're called to do. Don't be distracted. Don't be turned away. Don't be embarrassed by people who don't know anything about. Remember, the Pharisees weren't casting out demons, right? Uh, and a lot of times they failed as we had a demonstration in the scriptures there when they did do it. But they generally were not casting out demons. Uh, they were teaching people to live with them. That's what religion does today, false Christian religion. Just live with it. Just be forgiven. Some people are so hopeless of the promises of God, which they now believe are not for today, uh, that they don't have any hope of being delivered of demons. And it's so easy because you have authority over all their power. And authority is the right to use their power or command their power or command their power not to be used, you know, but it's authority over them. And that's what Jesus gave us, authority over all the power of the enemy. He said, these signs will accompany them that believe. You just need to believe, right? In my name. They will cast out demons in my name. I say the name of Jesus a lot when I'm casting out demons. And it does seem to bother them. <laughs> Sometimes I just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they get all in a tizzy. You know? And sometimes I talk about the blood because they don't want to hear about the blood either. Or if they remind you of your past, remind them of their future. <laughs> They don't like that either. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> well, Father, we thank you so much, Lord. And we ask that you give wisdom to all the brethren out there to be sanctified through this manner and all other manners that you've given us to do this. And that, um, that power will be given to the brethren for this sanctifying process that they will um, exercise faith in the Scriptures, maybe even copy down promises for them to, to remind them. That some people put them around in their house so they can see it, read it, and be reminded, you know. And thank you, Father, for being with us and uh, actually sending us power and authority too. Also sending us what we call the guardian angels. Everybody's got guardian angels. They're there to guard you. And you can tell them what to do. Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to do service that are heirs of salvation. You speak things that you want done. Like defend me today. Uh, right? And those, those angels, by the way, they have power over all demons. 
They have authority over all demons. You can enlist their help in getting the demons out. I've asked them many times, you know, uh, stick them with your sword. Make them uncomfortable in there, you know. Force them out. You know, that's what I've told the angels many times. And they, of course, do that. And uh, so you can enlist them, you know, as Hebrew says, to bring about and manifest the Lord's salvation. The Lord's salvation, He delivered us out of the powers of darkness. We've been given authority, as Ephesians says, they're all, all the principalities and powers are under the feet of the body of Christ. That's the very lowest member of the body of Christ has authority over the demons. No, you don't have to be somebody. You just need to be born again. And that makes you somebody in the eyes of Christ and somebody in the eyes of the demons. Because they know even a little baby Christian who has a little bit of knowledge can do them an awful lot of damage. And we thank you, Father, that we've been given total dominion over all of their power. And we should be taking it. By the way, keep on doing the battle in the, on the political front, too. There is some powerful things the enemy is trying to do. They're trying to bring about a, a world war and kill as many people as possible. They're trying to bring about, they've done several times, a plague. And it's been stopped several times, but it's not always going to be stopped. And that's because people don't pray. Don't do warfare. There is a terrible plague coming, friends. And God is even going to use it to take down the wicked who are hindering the kingdom of God. And so God uses vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. He's going to do this. Make sure you're not one of those taken down because you are exercising your faith in the promises of God. You are exercising your faith in the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ, who became accursed for us so that we could have Abraham's blessings, right? Eat the Lamb, which is the Word of God. Eat the Lamb. and Be defended against the enemy. Put up your shield of faith. Faith in what? Faith in the promises of God. Don't just let the promises go to waste. Find promises that cover anything you have, any problem that you have, any enemy that you have, and uh, know those promises and exercise them and swing them like a sword against the enemy and defend yourself like a shield, the shield of faith, right? Go to war. If you don't fight, you will lose. If you do fight according to wisdom, you will win. Oh, praise be to God. You will not fail. You will win. You can do warfare for your family. You can do warfare for people long distance. You know, it doesn't matter about distance in the, in the demonic realm. In the spiritual realm. We cast many demons out over the telephone. Many. It has nothing to do with nothing. You just have authority over them. No matter where they are, you can speak to them. So, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Thank you for this wisdom, this understanding, this grace. Please uh, reach out and touch our brethren. Give them such an interest in the Word that they will go in there and seek out how to be a disciple of Jesus in this matter of casting out demons and healing the sick and bringing salvation in all forms. Thank you, Father, for doing this for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for joining us, saints. We'll do this again sometime. Michael Hare is going to come and share a word with you, and we ask in the name of Jesus. Uh, that uh, Michael's word be anointed and blessed to touch all out there. By the way, Michael on his conference call, they've been casting out demons too. And uh, it's been a blessing to the people there, just like 
you know, and these these people, of course, are joining us from all over the world. So, um, but still, it doesn't make any difference. The Lord is casting out demons. He's uh, restoring people. He's delivering people from things they never even thought they could be delivered from. Praise be to God. Thank you, Father. So, thank you for that success. In Jesus' name. Good night, saints. Well, thank you, Brother David, and God bless you. Hello, saints. Good to be back with you again. Got kind of a cloudy day out there today, but it's nice and warm. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for the authority that you've given us over all the power of the enemy. Lord, your grace far exceeds anything that we can imagine or think about. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for your saving power uh, that, that we can utilize for your people to free them up from the demonic entities that surround us daily. Lord, we know that uh, all of these demons are here for one thing, and that is to manifest maturity in your believers, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you also for teaching us how to get rid of these things. And Father, I just ask that you bless us today with your word to show us a little bit about how the demons and the Christians interact to, to, to mature and grow your people. And I just praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for us, showing us how to get rid of these uh, demonic entities that uh, plague us for one thing, and that is to mature us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's what I will talk about, Christians and demons today. So let's start out and look at uh, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16. <clears throat> and when even was come, they brought unto him many possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our disease. Who's he talking about there when he says our? Well, it was Christians who spoke and wrote this verse. Jesus took the curse from us. He only took the curse from the people that ultimately believed him, right? Didn't he bear the curse for the world? Yeah. But it is to whosoever will. Whosoever will. The Bible says, No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him. John 6, 4 to 4. The elect will, because that's clear. The elect is going to. They are those who were chosen before the foundation of the world. Because that's what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, making known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him unto a dispensation of the fullness of the times to sum up all things in Christ and the things in heaven and the things upon the earth. In him, I say, in whom also we were made a heritage, having been foreordained 
according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we should be unto the praise of his glory, who we had before hoped in Christ, in whom ye also, having heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having also believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is an earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession unto the praise of his glory. They will be standing at the end of this thing. And many of the called, but not the elect, will. The elect will be standing at the end of this thing. They will have gotten their deliverance. They will have gotten what Jesus was talking about right here. The elect are those who bear fruit. That's the fruit of Jesus. He says in Matthew 22 and 14, For many are called, but few chosen. And that word chosen here is the same word for elect or eclectos. It's the same word. Many are called. You see, God called the Israelites out of Egypt. He said, out of Egypt did I call my son in Matthew 2 and 15. He said in Jude 1 verse 5, Now I desire to put you in remembrance, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Y'all see that? Calling is not election. Calling is on the way to election. Calling just means an invitation. You've been invited to partake of the body and blood of Christ. Jesus has invited us to partake of his body and the blood of Christ. And if we do that, we're going to bear fruit. And we're not going to have any problem bearing fruit if you do that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, here's the question he was asking. How can a Christian have a demon and yet have the Holy Spirit? Well, it's pretty simple. The Bible actually says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, or know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have from God, and ye are not your own? For ye were bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your body. Well, the body is a temple, because that's what it says in, in, in all the ancient manuscripts. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because the temple was a threefold temple. It was an outer court, a holy place, and the holy of holies. That outer court was called the court of the Gentiles. Now, you got to ask yourself, were the Gentiles holy? No. If anybody came into the holy of holies, they were struck dead right there. No evil could go into the holy of holies because that was the only place for the high priest. That's where the high priest dwells in us, the holy of holies. That's your spirit. And the demons don't enter into the spirit. The demons go into the flesh. That's the outer court. And we got proof of that from the examples back in the Old Testament, that evil people came into the outer court, and some even laid hands on the horns of the altar for mercy. Sometimes they found mercy, sometimes they didn't. But the point is, evil could come into the outer course, but it could not come into the Holy of Holies. Some people think that the Spirit of God will not dwell in an unclean temple. And if you're, if you're talking about the flesh, it is unclean. The Bible says the flesh is unclean and it's an enemy of God. Romans 8 and 6, for the mind of the flesh is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The Bible calls the flesh the enemy of God because it's unclean. 
In fact, when it talks about the lust of the flesh, those lusts have the same nature as the demons do. The flesh is unclean, and it ain't going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 and 50. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So, we see here that the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in an unclean temple when he dwells in your spirit because your spirit's clean. He has to give you a new spirit before he can even come and dwell in you. You have to be born again before he can come and dwell in that spirit. Galatians 4 and 6 says, Because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The thing about the demons is that the demons come into the flesh with that desire of possessing your soul. The Lord comes into your spirit with the desire of possessing your soul. And the warfare that we, the warfare that we experience is between flesh and spirit, God and demons, to, uh, in order to possess the soul. Why? Because your soul is your mind, your character, and your nature. And I'm going to show you what the Lord showed us about possession. We have been lied to about possession and oppression. What this possession is, is when the demon is reaching out of the flesh and into the soul and taking control of the mind and the actions and the character of the person. Y'all ever seen anybody that was schizophrenic? One moment, uh, they're given over to the lust of the flesh. And the next minute, they seem to straighten right up. Is he possessed? They are possessed when it happens. They're not when the demons backs off. You know what? That demon's still there. He had not gone anywhere. He just backs out of the soul into the flesh and is dormant. And he sits there until the next time he wants to take control. And the Holy Spirit's the same way. Think about this. Just because you have the Holy Spirit does not mean that you are being led by the Holy Spirit. Having the Holy Spirit ain't even going to save you. You know that? Here's what saves you. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. In Romans 8 and 14, you see, in other words, you can have it, but not be led by it. The same thing with demons. You can have them. But they, they don't have to be in control, do they? What we desire is to give possession of this land of our body to the spiritual man. And God, through the Spirit, gives us power through the spiritual man to possess our soul. Guess what? When you walk after the flesh, the Bible says you got to die. Romans 8 and 13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye must die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. You shall live. When you walk after the flesh, you let that devil power to reach into your soul and take control of your thinking, of your actions, of your nature, and your character. And the world calls that schizophrenia. But I'm going to tell you something. It's demon possession. There ain't no two ways about it. There's only one nature in you. There ain't no split nature or two natures. There's only one nature that is really you. And that devil likes to come into Christians and deceive them into thinking that it's them. That's all. They're, they're made up that way. And the best thing that the devil and demons like to do is to enter into Christian, Because they give themselves unto the lusts of the flesh, and then rule them by speaking in their minds and blending into their character so they don't even know that it's the devil. They think it's them. By the authority of God, demons are forced to manifest themselves. And some of you have seen that. You have seen the gospel being preached and demons manifesting in Christian. And they were forced to manifest because they hate the gospel. They hate tongues, and they hate the blood of Jesus. They hate a lot of things that are godly, and if you learn the things that they hate, those are your best weapons against them. A lot of you are going to find that out one of these days. 
And some of you already found out that these demons can hide in you very tactfully and make you think that their thinking is your thinking and that it's just you. These thoughts that are coming through your mind and maybe just by your flesh, these thoughts are coming into your mind. But when they are forced to manifest, you know it's a demon. And you can get into a circumstance or a situation where the Word of God torments these demons and they're going to manifest. And that's what happened in Jesus' presence. The Word of God forced them to manifest. Or if you have a person who is repentant and you command these demons to give their name and to manifest in some way, they're going to do it. They're going to do it because they have never been commanded to do that before. And if they have never been commanded to do that, you may never actually feel the presence of them. But when they are commanded to do this, they will literally speak out of a person and they give a name. We've experienced that just in the last week and a half. They'll argue with you. They'll lie to you. They'll try to hide from you. They do all the things that demons like to do. And here's here's a revelation for some of you. You can deliver yourself. Because we have been given authority to deliver ourselves. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, it is helpful to have other people, but you can deliver yourself. And if you've got a suspicion that something is more than just flesh, try it sometime. Exercise that authority that God gave us and command them to go. Sometimes they'll speak to your mind, and you'll get their name in your minds, and sometimes they'll just come right at your mouth. And any kind, listen to this, any kind of a compelling desire, a strong compelling desire, most times is a demon. It's not the flesh. The devil wants you to think it's the flesh, but it's a demon. We are walking in a process of being delivered every day. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is the process of delivering you of two things, defilement of flesh and spirit. Now stop stop and think about that a moment. We just saw that in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Is your spirit defiled? If it is, you're not a Christian. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in a new, clean spirit that is called the Christ in you. Galatians 4 and 6. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's a Christian. God says in Ezekiel 36 and 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. So, you see that you don't have a defiled spirit. So, why does the scripture say, now it's talking to Christians here, Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Well, because the defilement of spirit he's talking about here is the defilement of you by spirit. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the defilement of your spirit. Your spirit is not defiled, folks. Your spirit is the only part of you that's totally white and it's clean. And if it's not, you ain't a Christian, okay? So the defilement that we have authority to get rid of is the defilement of our soul by the flesh Because the word is yourself. You know what yourself is in the Bible? That's a synonym for the term for soul. In some gospels it'll say self and in another it'll say soul. Proving that self and soul are the same. They're interchangeable. We want to be delivered of all defilement of our soul by both flesh and spirit. 
in the King James Version of the Bible. Now listen to this. If you got a King James, it says, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. Listen to this. The King James adds in your spirit. But spirit is not in the ancient manuscripts. You don't have anything to do with glorifying God in your spirit. That was already accomplished by Jesus Christ. But you do have something to do with glorifying God in your body. That's why he put that authority on us. Colossians 3 and verse 5. Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake come the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience, wherein ye also once walked when ye lived in these things. But now do ye also put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, railing, shameful speaking out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off that old man with his doings, and have put on the new man that is being renewed unto knowledge after the image of him that created him. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, neither give place to the devil. Now that word place means region or area. It's a geographical area. It says neither give place to the devil. And this is the exact Thing God talked about when he was cleansing the promised land from the Hittites and Gergeshites and all them little white boys. Deuteronomy 71, when the, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it and shall cast out many nations before thee, the Hittite and the Gergeshite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. When he was cleansing them, he told them, don't leave any place where these people still live in your land because they're going to make you to sin. Now, verse 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them up before thee, and thou shalt smite them, then... Thou shalt utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughters thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For he will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and he will destroy thee quickly. Every one of those ites had gods. You know what that means? What God is talking about is if you leave a place for the lust of the flesh to live in, your land, you're going to sin. You are to give them no place for the lust of the flesh. In Luke 13, it speaks of a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. She had it for 18 years. And when Jesus delivered that woman, he said in verse 16, Luke 13 and 16, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound to these 18 years, to have been loosed from this bond on the day of the Sabbath? A daughter of Abraham. Well, some of you are thinking, well, he's just talking about Jews here. No, no Jesus never called the Jews daughters and sons of Abraham. Did you know that? Let me show you this in in, in John chapter 8. These were people that confessed to be sons of Abraham, but Jesus totally disagreed with them. You know who a daughter of Abraham is? A daughter of Abraham is somebody who is truly in covenant with God. And right here, these Jewish leaders and their followers thought they were sons and daughters of Abraham. But Jesus said, no, you ain't. Jesus called this woman a daughter of Abraham. Verse 38, I speak the things which I have seen with my father, and you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said unto him, Our father is Abraham. And Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Well, here's the point. 
you would do the works of Abraham. Then verse 40, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I heard from God. This did not Abraham. You do the works of your father. They said unto him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came forth and am come from God. For neither have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you, Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, it is your will to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and stands not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. Boy, he hammered him, didn't he? Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 that the people that walk by faith, those are the sons of Abraham. Verse 7 of Galatians 3. Know therefore that they are of faith, the same are sons of Abraham. Jesus didn't agree with that ever. This woman got her deliverance because she was a daughter of Abraham, and she did it by faith. The people that were coming to Jesus were covenant people, just like we are covenant people. They had the right of the covenant. They got healing and deliverance from God. They had a right to that. Now, the world doesn't have a right to that. None at all. You're casting the children's bread to the dogs when you try to give deliverance to an unrepentant person. And let me say this. If you're trying to give deliverance to a Christian who is unrepentant, you're going to have the same problem. We're proving who it is who truly belongs to Christ. The overcomers are the ones who truly belong to Christ. They're going to be the ones who are proven to be the elect of God. And we can prove ourselves just as much as sons of the devil by our actions as these people prove themselves to be sons of the devil by their actions. And Jesus pointed out to them, no, if you were of your father Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham. They wasn't doing the works of Abraham, was they? they have done the works of their father, the devil. So, you see, we're proving ourselves through this trial in the wilderness that we're going through to either be sons of Abraham or sons of the devil. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and 6, He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Are you walking like Jesus? It says in 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve in his craftiness, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity that is toward Christ. That word yours means, of course, Christian, because it's Christians that are being addressed here. Now, verse 4, For if he that comes preaches another gospel whom we did not preach, or if you receive a different spirit which you did not receive, or a different gospel which you did not accept, you see that? Ye do well to bear with him. Listen, you can be perverted and corrupted in your mind by listening to a false gospel and receiving a false spirit. There are spirits of religion, and their job is to keep people in bondage to religion. That's their job, folks. If the devil can't keep you from Jesus at all, what's he going to do? He's going to keep you in bondage to religion. And when you get in bondage to religion... You ain't going to accept all of what that word says. Religion only accepts a bit here and a piece there of the word. All religions do that. And if you're not in bondage to believe what they say you got to believe, and you get into the scriptures, seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling, you can believe all the word. That's the whole point. God don't want us separated from the truth by religion. And that's what they're famous for, is separating the gospel, from the true gospel, from their religion. You know what religion is? Religion is to try to see if you're going to overcome it. Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You mean the Holy Spirit led him to be tempted? Yeah, he did. Matthew 4 and 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit 
into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It's the Spirit's purpose for you to be tempted of the devil. How come? To see who's going to be the overcomers and the elect. To see who's going to be the true believers. When he led them into the wilderness, he found out real quick who the true believers were. Those were the ones who confessed the word of God. Folks, we're in the wilderness experience to find out and to prove who the true believers are. The Bible says in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, Wherefore, brethren, give the more diligence to make sure to, oh, I'm sorry, give the more diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never stumble. For thus shall be richly supplied unto you the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You mean we're entering into the kingdom as we overcome these trials? Yep, that's what the Bible said. We're entering into God's kingdom as we overcome. Your spirit entered into the kingdom when you stepped across that line and proclaimed yourself as saved through the grace of Jesus Christ. Your spirit entered across and now your soul is entering across through your obedience to the truth. Jesus said, He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives in Isaiah 61 and 1 and Luke 4 and 18. And he also said, if you don't make these things right with your brother in the way, that you would be thrown back into prison until you paid your debt. Matthew 5 and 23. If therefore thou art offering thy gift at the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art with him in the way, lest happily the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officers, and you be and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou have paid the last farthing. We saw that back in Matthew at 18. He said, You're going to be delivered to your tormentors till you Pay all that was due, Matthew eighteen thirty four, which is what? Your sins. Because if a person doesn't forgive, they're not forgiven. He says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses, Matthew 6 and 13, or 15. Can you be saved and not be forgiven? No, you can't be saved and not be forgiven. I believe in all honesty, the most dangerous sin that a person can have is unforgiveness because it opens up a trap to demons many times. You know, where Paul, by the Spirit, turned a man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in 1 Corinthians 5 and 5, and that he turned that man over to Satan for a good reason. Now, we think with our carnal mind that it's always good for people to get delivered of demons. No, it's not. It's not always good. God's got a purpose for the demons because if he didn't, he would have wiped them out a long time ago, wouldn't he? Because he's got that power to do that. And he ain't got an interest right now in wiping them out. Why? Because they've got a purpose here on earth. The Bible says that God has vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Romans 9 and 21 says, Or hath not the plot potter a right over the clay for the same lump to make one part of vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Listen, the demons are the heads of vessels of dishonor, and they got a purpose. And their purpose is to do several things. One is for chastening. In 1 Corinthians 5 and 5, Paul turned a man over for chastening so that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. There's another example over in 1 Timothy 1 and 20, where Paul delivered Hamanaeus and Alexander over to Satan, that they might not be taught to blaspheme. You see, that's chastening and teaching, because the devil is God's messenger 
to chasing people. When you get out from under the blood, that devil will jump on you like a mad dog. And it don't matter whether you're a Christian or not. A person who's not a Christian is under bondage to the devil. And sometimes that devil doesn't want to rock the boat for him. And there ain't no advantage for him in revealing himself to them. They're already there. They're already caught. But for you, it's a different story. When you step out from under the blood, man, he's sitting there waiting for you. And he's waiting to chew on you a little bit so you can say, hey, I need to get out, get back under the blood. I need to repent and obey. But you know what? He has authority over you until you get back under the blood for a purpose. And that is to motivate you to live in obedience and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what they're there here for. We have examples all through the Bible where God turned his people over to the devil. And they wasn't nobody that could cast that demon out of him. And if you don't repent, and you don't ask for deliverance, and if you're not willing to repent of the sin, you don't need to ask for deliverance from the demon who preys upon the sin. He's there for a purpose. He's there to make your life miserable until you repent. That's what he's there for. I, I, listen, I, I've seen that happen before. I've tried casting demons out of people that wouldn't stay out. And I figured, finally figured out that the problem was I was getting out of God's will. I was out there doing my own thing. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 16 is a good example. God ordained Saul and filled him with the Spirit and had him prophesy. But when he rebelled against God and did his own thing, then it says over in verse 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubles thee. Y'all think that's a false doctrine? No, it's the truth. The Lord showed me one time, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In Philippians 2 and 13, God, salvation, folks, is great. Because the, the way God saves you is that he puts in you that desire to do what's right. And it's simple. It's easy. The gospel is, is real simple. And, you, and the way you get the desire to do what is right is through repentance and faith. If you repent and believe, you get the desire to do what's right. That's what salvation is all about. I want, uh, did you know that God does this with vessels of dishonor? Just like he does it with vessels of honor. He does it with the devil. Y'all remember that story about Job that the devil didn't have any interest in Job until God waved that red flag in front of him. And God sicked him on him. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's the red flag right there. Hey, devil, come here. I want to show you something. For there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. That's all that devil needed. Wasn't it? God was using that devil. Man, I was just like hanging a carrot before a donkey, wasn't it? That devil was ready and willing to jump on Job. But you know what? God made conditions about everything. He said, no, you can't touch his body, okay? And the devil told God, if you touch his body, he'll curse you to your face. And God said, he's in your hand. And then verse 4, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will renounce thee to thy faith. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he's in thy hand. Only spare his life. There's the condition. You know what? Many times the devil is the hand of the Lord. He's the left hand of God. You know why? Because Satan said, If you touch his body, he'll curse you to your face. But then God said, Okay, he's in your hand. He gave him permission. The devil didn't have permission before, but now God said, okay, he's in your hand. In every case, God was turning Job over to the devil 
for a curse or a chastening or whatever. When God, uh, I'm sorry, when Job was confronted by his wife, when his wife said, uh, he said unto her, Thou speaks as one of the foolish women speaks. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, or shall we not receive evil? And in all this did not Job sin with his lips, in Job 2.10. Meaning, he told the truth. You can't say that God only controls good and still be sovereign. He can't be sovereign if he only controls good. It's not true. Why is the devil here? Why didn't he wipe him out when he goofed back there in the Garden of Eden? And why do we need a Savior before Adam ever fell? Since Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God's not making any mistake here, folks. What we're going through is creation. And the devil is a part of that creation of, of little Jesus is walking throughout this world. God turned Saul over to a demon spirit because he was in rebellion. And he did it often. In the Old Testament, he did it to Abimelech and the men of Shechem. God turned them over to devils, and devils got in there and divided them because they killed the sons of Jerubbabel, the sons of Gideon. God did this. God sent evil spirits between Israelites to divide them. Did you know that when Samuel was rebuking Saul for not obeying God in 1 Samuel fifteen twenty three? He said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Y'all remember that verse? Except for one thing, the word witchcraft, you probably have a note in your Bible, in Hebrew means divination. You know what a divination spirit is? It's a false prophecy spirit. It's a spirit that prophesies for the devil. Let me give you an example of this in uh, 1 Samuel 18. Y'all think that Saul had a demon spirit? I'll tell you, one he had was a spirit of divination. It says in 1 Samuel 18 and 10, And it came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David delayed or played with his hand as he did day by day. And Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Well, what was that evil spirit and why was he prophesying? It was divination. Saul had a spirit of divination. Now, I don't know what spirit God was talking about, an evil spirit from the Lord in 1 Samuel 16 and 14. And I don't know if this was a spirit of divination or not, but I do know that he had a spirit of divination because he became a false prophet. Now, whether that evil spirit from God was the same one, you don't know. You can't tell. The scripture don't say. But it was tormenting him, wasn't it? Here was a man who at one time was full of the Holy Spirit and was tormented by a demon spirit. He had a demon spirit, maybe two demon spirits. Think about this. Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, And by reason of the exceeding greatness of the revelations that I should not be exalted over much, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me that I should not be exalted over much. Now, I ain't saying that there was a demon inside of Paul. I ain't saying that. I'm just making a point that on, that an angel of Satan was tormenting Paul. That's not a, I don't believe it's an affirmative because only the King James gives that. No other Bible has that translation. It wasn't true. Paul didn't have an infirmity, y'all. That's false doctrine. But he did have tormentors. In 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, Paul said his thorn in the flesh Notice that it was a thorn in the flesh, was a messenger of Satan. And that word messenger in the scriptures, 181 times out of 183, is the word angel. He was an angel of Satan. An angel of Satan was sent to buffet him. And that word buffet 
means to hit many times over and over and over again. And that wasn't talking about one infirmity or one sickness. Like the King James says, it has infirmity. But no other Bible version. It goes back to the ancient manuscript. Put infirmity there. The truth is that it's not the word infirmity there. It's the word weakness. The Bible says that Christ was crucified through weakness. 2 Corinthians 13 and 3. Seeing that you seek a proof of Christ that speaks in me. (coughs) Excuse me. Who to you word is not weak, but is powerful in you, for he was crucified through weakness, yet he lives through the power of God. That's the same word right there that claims infirmity. Paul didn't have an infirmity. God's not going to say, who healeth all thy diseases, and then turn right around and say, no, Paul, you keep this disease. It's good for you. What you have here is a schizophrenic, schizophrenic God. That ain't the God that I serve. That's a lie. This messenger of Satan is the one who was bringing all these torments against Paul that we talked about in the the previous chapters of Corinthians. Paul points out in prisons abundantly, in deaths often, in labors and travails, hunger, thirst, cold, nakedness. And he made a list of all the places where he said he was weak. Same word. 2 Corinthians 11.23 Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as one beside himself. I more in labors, more abundantly, in prisons, more abundantly, in stripes, above measures, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That's not a disease, folks. That's not an infirmity. That was somebody beating on the man. (laughs) Twenty-five, thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, journeyings often in perils of rivers, in perils of robbers, in perils from my countrymen, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in labor and travail, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Who was it that was tormenting Paul? In all these ways, it says it was a messenger of Satan. He was bringing Paul through all of these tribulations. He was keeping Paul humble, wasn't he? Now, when Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness, who was he to be tempted tempted by? It was the devil. Don't think that you're not going to be faced with the demon. You are going to be faced with demons. And if you're in the wilderness, you're going to be faced with demons. And you have every right and every power from God to overcome them. Paul was faced with demons. God didn't say that he's going to take that angel from Satan away. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee, Paul. And he didn't say, my grace is this infirmity that I'm putting on you that you're going to have to keep. That's crazy. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, by whose stripes you were healed, 1 Peter 2.24. You were healed, past tense. God's not going to make a condition to this. There is no condition to this except you repent and believe. That's not an infirmity. What it is, it's this list of things that Paul said and professed, professed that he called his weaknesses in 2 Corinthians 11 and 30. He said this list were his weaknesses. That's the same exact word. A demon was bringing Paul into these positions of weaknesses. And when he got into these positions of weakness, he put his trust in the Lord. And the Lord saved him. In every instance, the Lord saved him. Psalms 34 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Where do they come from? In most cases, they come from the devil. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Folks, that's what we got to believe. That's the gospel. And if you don't believe it, you don't get it. You need to believe that. The devil has a purpose. And he's used by God to chasten us and to bring under curses those who are in rebellion to God. And he's used by God 
to give you teaching and understanding that they might not be taught not to slap, to blaspheme. First Timothy 1 and 20. Let me read it again. That they might be taught not to blaspheme. The devil is used by God to humble us to see the power of God. And when the devil puts you into a situation that where you're weak, that's when you get to see a miracle. You don't get to see a miracle when you have everything that you need and all your problems are solved. You're walking in the anointing and the power. You know what? The power of God comes in every case when you are in a position where you can't do nothing about it. The power of God comes sometimes when you refuse to do anything about it. You just put your trust in God and His Word and you believe what the Bible says, by whose stripes you were healed. And if you believe that, you know what? You get healed. Let me give you another example over in uh, Psalm 78. When the children of Israel rebelled, God sent demons to them. In verse 49, He cast upon them the fierceness of His anger, wrath and indignation and trouble, a band of angels of evil. You see that? Did you know that these are demons, wrath, indignation, and trouble? That's demon spirits. This is who they are. And the Lord delivered the Israelites over to the demons for torment because they were in rebellion. It was God's purpose to do that. God delivers a person over to demons. And he turns people over to a reprobate mind, too, I want you to know. You know, sometimes you don't recognize people that are demon-possessed because they're being ruled by that spirit. You understand that something's wrong with them, but you might not recognize it's in the flesh. Most often, people are oppressed. If a demon's in your flesh and he's just abiding in your flesh and he's not reaching into the soul, he can't oppress you from the flesh. When he reaches into the soul, that's what the Bible calls possessed. And we've been taught that when demons are on the outside, that's oppression. And when they're on the inside, that's possession. That's wrong. The devil can be in your flesh and never leave your flesh. He can oppress you from the flesh, or he can reach into the soul and possess you. And other times, he'll back off into the flesh and be dormant. And you won't even know he's there. That's a problem with Christians. When they're faced with certain stimuli from the outside, these demons come up and manifest. And when that stimuli is gone or that temptation is gone, they draw back into the flesh and they become dormant. Take a person with a spirit of anger. They're not angry all the time. They're only angry when they're tempted. And sometimes if it's a demon of anger, it's overwhelming. And if you try to deal with it as though it was only a lust of the flesh, you're going to fail because it's more than that. You know, many people, maybe all people, when they come to Christ, they got demons. You think God drives them all out at the same time? Well, I can prove to you that he don't do that. He does not drive them out all at the same time. And I want to prove something to you because some people have said it's okay to be angry. Just don't sin. That's a false doctrine. It's a false doctrine, and they get it from a false interpretation of Scripture. Listen to what the Bible says. Anger resteth in the bosom of fools, in Ecclesiastes 7 and 9. It says, if you got it in your bosom, it's going to make a fool out of you. Well, wait a minute. I thought I could be angry, but just don't sin. No. Anger is wrong. You know what anger is? Anger is unforgiveness. Anger is bitterness. Can the Holy Spirit be angry? Well, the Holy Spirit can be angry. The Holy Spirit can even manifest anger through you. He can do this legally. The Holy Spirit can speak through you and judge, but you can't. If you judge, you're going to be judged, the Word of God says. Matthew 7 and 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. If the Holy Spirit judges, that's okay. But you know the difference between the Holy Spirit moving through you for the sake of God and you being tempted by the lust of your flesh? You can tell the difference. In Ephesians 4 and 25, it says, Wherefore, putting away falsehood, speak ye truth, each one with his neighbor. 
for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. You know something? There wasn't a punctuation in that verse. In the Greek, they didn't have punctuation and capitals and all of that stuff. The punctuation was put there by theologians. Let me tell you something about this verse that's supposed to be a there's supposed to be a question mark behind it. Can you be angry and sin not? Well, the rest of the verse says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, don't let that stuff stick around. And then over in verse 27, neither give place to the devil. You know what happens if you're angry? You're going to give place to the devil when you're angry. And that's unforgiveness. We have to forgive everybody all the time forever. The Bible says anger rests in the bosom of fools. And you know what? The more understanding you get, the less anger you're going to have. For instance, if you know and believe in a sovereign God, and you know that to them that love God, all things work together for good in Romans 8 and 28, you're not going to be angry at the situation. You ain't going to be angry even at your circumstances. Listen, a dog does what a dog is, and he ain't going to do any different. And because he's a dog... We don't get angry at him for doing dog stuff, do we? Would you get angry at the devil for doing what he normally does? Folks, that's a waste of time. He's a devil. Devil do what devils do. That's what they're created to do, and that's what they do, you see. You just have to understand that. When your child is small and stumbles and falls, you don't get angry at them because that's what children do. They stumble and fall. So what I'm saying is don't be angry at your circumstances. Just believe that it's God working in you, making corrections here and there, just getting you straightened up for the kingdom of God and to make you a disciple of Christ, one who walks in the steps of Jesus. Well, folks, I'm out of time. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Maybe we can carry it on a little bit further. God bless you. For information, materials, and to contribute, go to unleavenedbreadministries.org. Contributions only may be addressed to David Eels, Post Office Box 231616, Montgomery, Alabama, 36123. Quench my thirsting soul. Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For oh, your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus. darkest night what will be my guiding light the shining rays of red and white Jesus I trust in you sacred heart in you I find mercy seated for all time I am yours and you are mine oh Jesus I trust in you Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus.
Jesus, I trust in you.